Hello, my name is Mike Wittesauer and I've prepared this presentation entitled Irreconcilable Differences, Productivity Partners, Propriety Limited and the ACCC. And the reason I've called it Irreconcilable Differences is because you have two judgments in this case from the full federal court and they're totally different. They're irreconcilable. The decision of Wigney and O'Brien, which is the majority judgment obviously, takes a particular view about statutory unconscionability under Section 20 one of the Australian consumer law, which is entirely different from the dissenting uh, position taken by Justice Downs. And they approach the, the statutory words differently, the way the statute should be applied, as well as um, some of the cases. So it's very concerning that three senior judges of the court take such a different approach to the way statutory and contribuity should be interpreted and applied on the same facts. Now, a bit of background about myself. I'm a competition and consumer lawyer, and I've been running my own practice to say early consulting for the last 15 years, and I help companies, individuals with competition and consumer law matters. I also do expert consultancy work on competition and consumer law for a few publishers, such as uh, CCH Walters Kluwers and uh, LexisNexis. Part of the work at the ACCC for 15 years in a variety of roles, including as Director of Enforcement. Now, the relevant background is where I'll start. Then I'll go through the specific case. And the full case name is Productivity Partners for Product Limited Trading as Captain Cook College. So that was obviously a trading name. Majority judgment of Wigney and O'Brien. Then I'll look at the dissent by Justice Downs and some commentary. Now, the relevant background is that there was this uh, vocational education training program rolled out by the Commonwealth Government, and effectively, VET providers could enrol students to these online courses and receive payments from the Commonwealth Government. And unfortunately, what developed was the systems were such that unscrupulous recruitment agents went out to various places in uh, re regional Australia and remote communities and signed up lots of people to these courses by making a lot of misrepresentations, namely that they could sign up to the course without incurring any financial liability, that they didn't actually have to do any work. And they offered, often offered people inducements such as laptops and iPads to sign up to the course. So a lot of unscrupulous behaviour going on throughout the whole industry. And the ACCC has taken quite a number of cases against VAT providers, most of which, I think all of which, have gone into liquidation and vast amounts of money uh, that was incurred by these consumers has been effectively forgiven by the Commonwealth Government. So it's a very uh, bad industry conduct which involved a lot of companies, including a lot of high profile companies. This is the last case, I think, on the books. And this case, even though the company's gone out of business, I think it's fighting it on the basis of some insurance policies that were in place. Uh, earlier. So the appeal grounds, I think, principally were that the conduct engaged in by the college was not unconscionable in breach of Section 21 of the Australian Consumer Law. Now, the number of specific appeal grounds, firstly, that the, the college had not actually engaged in a system of conduct or pattern of behaviour which was unconscionable. Secondly, that Mr. Wills, who was the CEO, acting CEO of the business for a period of time, was not only concerned in the college's systemic unconscionable conduct, another senior exec of the business actually pleaded out to having breached the law separately. They also alleged that the consumers A, B, D and E were subject to various misrepresentations and unconscionable conduct by these recruitment agents and that that conduct could not be attributed to the college pursuant to section 139b of 2 of the Competition Consumer Act. So effectively, the allegation or the, the appeal ground was that these agents were acting outside the scope of their actual or apparent authority, so the conduct could not be attributed to the college. And finally, that consumers B to E the conduct in relation to them was not unconscionable because the money that the college received from the Commonwealth Government for those consumers was actually refunded to the Commonwealth Government once it was discovered there was some inappropriate conduct had occurred. So just to cut to the chase a bit, the majority judgment 
made three major conclusions or three findings. So the appeal was upheld on three grounds. Firstly, the declarations were problematic, made the the declarations made by the primary judge were problematic. There was ambiguity. They're very long and complex. And so the majority thought that they needed to be redrafted, although there's a strong suggestion in their judgment that maybe the primary judge who to whom the matter has been remitted should maybe just not worry about uh, imposing uh, uh, any declarations because I guess if they get too long and complex, they may not be very helpful. Secondly, they did find that there was no unconscionable conduct in relation to consumers B to E on the basis that the problems with the conduct towards those students had been identified by the college, the money refunded and the students um, um, removed from the relevant courses. And there was a third finding which wasn't really substantively important at all. Effectively, the primary judge had concluded that Mr. Wills was not only concerned in the college's unconscionable conduct from a particular date, which was a date of implementation of this new enrolment process, but uh, the full court concluded that he wasn't not only concerned until a later date when he became the acting CEO of the college in 20th December 2015. So there's no substantive impact of that finding. Now, I guess looking at the systemic unconscionable conduct appeal ground, the courts concluded there was no error made by the primary judge, that the conduct of the college was rightly condemned as unconscionable, and they knew full well of the risk and prevalence of misconduct by recruitment agents. It was well known not only in the industry that recruitment agents were engaging in very unscrupulous behaviour, but it had been in the media and the, the relevant government department had uh, communicated concerns about this to various VT providers, so it was well known. The college had enrolled unwitting or unsuitable students and large numbers of them, they changed their policy, enrolment policy, significantly at the behest of agents who were saying that they, effectively the college's standards were too high and needed to be dropped down if the agents weren't going to work for uh, Captain Cook College unless they reduced their enrolment standards and allowed more people in. So the college intentionally weakened its safeguards, obviously to satisfy the agents, but also to increase increase the revenue that they were getting from the Commonwealth Government. And Wigney and O'Brien concluded that it was entirely foreseeable that once the enrolment policy was changed, that there would be problems. They knew that students were being enrolled unwillingly or without full knowledge of the obligations, the financial obligations that they would incur. So obviously sometime down the, in, the, in the future, if the students did increase the income that they were earning, they would have to pay the debt back to the Commonwealth Government. So that wasn't made clear to students. The opposite was actually being conveyed to students. They were enrolling people who clearly lacked sufficient language, literacy or numeracy skills or technology skills or simple access. So some of the consumers didn't have broadband or have any hardware on which to access the online course. So they're totally unsuited to doing online study. And this was done, it was entirely foreseeable, it was done to enrich the college financially and it did harm thousands of people who suffered a lot of anxiety about having debts, which fortunately the, the federal government wrote off. So to remove that anxiety from those, those individuals. So as you can see in the last sentence there, the college is required to be held responsible for the misleading conduct of its agents. Now the appeal grounds, are a lot of appeal grounds, so I haven't gone through them all. And lot, there were actually a lot of appeal grounds on factual issues. And I think it's important when you're appealing a decision that you focus on your strongest points. You really don't want to waste everybody's time, the court and the, and the ACCC's time with un, unmeritorious appeal grounds. And I think here you can see the court expressing its dissatisfaction with one of the appeal grounds, the way uh, appeal ground one had been framed. And as you can see, they say, perversely, it was submissions advanced by the appellants in support of ground one that involved a selective approach to the facts, failed to confront the totality of the factual circumstances. They engaged in cherry picking and nitpicking. So they've put an appeal ground to the court, which is cherry-picked various facts, 
created a narrative and said, well, there's no unconscionable conduct because you've got to look at these particular facts, whilst ignoring, as it says there, the totality of the factual circumstances as found by the primary judge. They also noted that the submission that the appellants made that the primary judge's findings did not demonstrate that the college took advantage of the risk of agent misconduct was incorrect. The risks and problems associated with the VET scheme and the college's use of these recruitment agencies was well known to the college. As I said earlier, it was in the media, it was well known in the industry, everybody knew what these agents were getting up to. And the interesting fact is that prior to them changing the policy, 50% of their students were withdrawing or being withdrawn from the course before the first census state, which means that the college wasn't, wasn't getting any money from the Commonwealth Government for those students. But after the enrolment policy was changed, the number of students staying in, after, staying in the course till after the enrolment date, the census date, rose to over 80 percent so clearly a lot of more money was going into the pockets of the college and as you see in the last sentence there this was not merely a th theoretical risk it was a manifest problem now on the declaration point they noted that it was less than ideal the way it was drafted as i said earlier it was very complicated and the problem with it was it was intermingling various temporal dimensions of the impugned conduct so there's a lot of findings made as to when particular conduct occurred and really there was uh, problems with the way the the declaration was, was drafted and that's been remitted back to justice stewart to look at now appeal ground three was this general appeal ground that effectively the primary judge was required to go through all the factors in section 22 which has a range of factors which uh, may be taken into consideration to determine whether the conduct is unconscionable. So they allege in their appeal documents that the judge was required to go through each of those factors and effectively find whether they uh, were breached by the college or not breached by the college. And if they weren't breached by the college, then that was actually a, a factor in their favour. That was the submission made. Now, the basis for that argument was based on the Pacheco case, the High Court case, and some of the Gagler's comments. And the way the case was presented to the full court was, in the view of the majority, quite misleading. They're saying Justice Gagler did not say that where it is evident that there would be evidence in respect of matters identified in Section 22 but evidence going to that issue is not led by the moving party, that fact does not render the fact neutral or irrelevant. So effectively, these, these factors may be relevant to the assessment of conscious conduct. You can't be assuming that they have to be ticked off, the to tick the box exercise. And they go on and say, nor did he want to say that the absence of relevant evidence of the identified criteria where the evidence would have been readily available if it pointed to unconscious conduct is itself a fact to be, to be weighed. So if there's no evidence about a particular factor, the court shouldn't be seeking to take that into consideration. It can't just be uh, looking at, at material uh, or making assumptions about material that hasn't been put before the court. And the last the last sentence probably captures it. The problems with any such principle are self-evident, inviting the court to speculate as to whether it is evident that evidence would have been available on the enumerated matters. So it's effectively a submission asking the court to speculate about matters which haven't been the subject of any evidence put before the court. And they go through and they look at some of further comments by Gagler, and he did make this statement about the use of the word may in section 22 and saying it's not permissive but conditional. So it means the matters that are enumerated are to be taken into account if and to the extent that they are relevant to the case in hand. So you're only looking at them if they're relevant to the to the case and the and the facts as presented, not a case of needing to go through and consider every one and decide, make some finding about each factor. And you can see at the end of that quote from Cobalt case, you have to look at the factors that have a potential to bear positively or negatively on the characterization of the conduct as conduct that is or is not unconscionable. 
and each of which must be taken into account if and to the extent that it is applicable in all the circumstances. So it's that second part that's very relevant. You've got to consider whether if and to what extent one of those factors is relevant to the facts before the court. And here the majority is responding to this uh, claim by the appellants that really there's a need for the judge to very clearly identify each of the factors on the section 22 and deal with them in, in a very clear manner. And what they say there, that, that there's really no, um, you know, clearly the judge didn't go through and identify the matters that they were considering by looking at the at the uh, specific paragraph numbers in section 22, but they note that there's no legal requirement to identify the matters in that way. The relevant question is whether Honor, whether his honour took the matters into account to ex to the extent that the parties relied upon them. So this sort of very formulaic approach to sort of say, factor A, I conclude X, and factor B, I conclude Y, isn't required. There's no suggestion that the legislation requires that to be done. And this is probably the big point of difference in opinion with the dissenting judgment of Justice Downs. Now, they looked at Wills's accessorial liability, and there was submission made here that the accessory must have actual knowledge of the conduct possessed, that the conduct possesses an unconscionable character is against good conscience, or adopting the modern framing of the test is contrary to the relevant norm or standard. So they're saying that in order to establish uh, accessorial liability in relation to conscionability, unconscionability, the ACCC would have to prove this level of knowledge. And further, that the accessory must know the predatory nature of the conduct. And again, they're sort of trying to rely on Gagler's uh, comments in the Cobell case. And they just say, that, well, that's not correct. Like, There's no support in the authorities that that's the approach to take. It's just wrong in principle. And relevantly, a requirement that an accessory must know that the imputed conduct breaches the standard or norms of behaviour required by the law of unconscionable conduct is in all practical senses equivalent to requirement that an accessory must know that the impugned conduct breaches the law. Such a requirement has always been issued by the courts. So they've they put up submission to the court, which is just contrary to all the authorities. And I, I guess the suggestion that maybe uh, Justice Gagler's name being taken in vain, is saying that he said various things when really that's not what he found in, in the Cobell case. And they go on and say that all the above authorities, and they list a wide range of authorities, are consistent with the principle, and this is going back to York and Lucas, the High Court case many years ago, with the principle that accessorial liability is dependent upon knowledge of facts, not knowledge of the legal obligation or content of legal standards. And they draw out, the obviously, the policy problems with the approach put forward by the appellants, that otherwise persons who are ignorant of the law or ignorant of the standards and norms of behaviour required by the law would avoid liability. And as... Uh, just as Huey said in Coggan, it would be perverse if the morally obtuse avoided liability for their involvement in unconscionable conduct by reason that they were subjectively lacked a sufficient commercial conscience. Effectively, people without any commercial conscience would be able to avoid liability for accessorial liability under unconscionable conduct because they have no sense of what's commercially appropriate. So it's, it's, it's a pretty ridiculous submission to make, and I, I'm surprised that these submission should be made to the court and I think I to take my hat off to the court to be critical of these submissions to let the advocates know that these are not these are not good submissions to be making to a court you really are wasting everybody's time now what they did find that there was an error by the primary judge in when Mr Willis became Mr. Wills became not only concerned, and they're, they're saying that it was from a date later on that the primary judge fi found, but this has no substantive uh, impact on, on the case whatsoever because the fact that he was not only concerned at a later date doesn't remove his liability for the conduct. Then the actual apparent authority point was important. Again, there was these uh, arguments made that because the agents were engaging in, in very repre reprehensible conduct, that the college could not be held to be liable for that because they were well outside the scope of their actual or apparent authority. And the judge based his conclusion that they were 
liable for the conduct of the the college was liable for the the, the conduct of the agents because firstly the relevant agency agreements required the agent to ensure that prospective students were informed that the agent was providing services as an agent also they styled the agent as a course advisor for the college and sent the agent into the field holding out to the whole world that they were an agent and they had the usual or expected authority of a course advisor and they obviously gave the agent apparent authority to make representations on behalf of the college and finally the contravening conduct occurred in the course of recruiting persons and students which was conduct that the agents were authorized to engage in and i think the key thing here is you know everybody knew what these uh, agents were doing it's not like uh, the college was unaware of what they were doing. So it's very difficult to say we can't be held liable for the conduct of our agents because they're acting outside their apparent authority, even though we know what they're doing and we're financially benefiting from what they're doing. So the relevance of the refunds in relation to the consumers B to E was significant. And here they said it's highly relevant the college learnt of the unconscionable treatment of these consumers by the re recruitment agents and move swiftly to remedy and cancel their enrollments. So they concluded that the finding by the primary judge that the contractual conduct had happened in relation to these particular consumers was incorrect, and this couldn't be considered as unconscionable. So a small win for the appellants on that point. Now, Downs dissented very strongly on all the issues, and she came to the, the directly opposite conclusion to the majority. First, she concluded the primary judge's approach was flawed because he didn't go through all the Section 22 factors as he was required to. And then she says here quite strongly, as has been observed already, regard must be had to all the considerations listed in Section 22 to the extent that they are relevant to the particular case. And then she quotes all these different cases that apparently establish that principle. Now, the problem here is the majority said that that's not correct principle. So somebody's wrong here. Who is it? Um, I'd suggest it's Justice Downs. We just go to one of the uh, one of the authorities she cited, the quantum case, which is probably the leading case on this whole area. And she quotes paragraphs 55 and 56. So let's have a look what 55 and 56 say. So here's the extract from Quantum. And you can see, as Jagler identified the correct view of perspective as the second, a statutory standard to be developed judicially as stated by the full court in the Lux Distributors case. And then it goes on and quotes Gagler. And here he says, the correct perspective is that 12CB was the ASIC Act, which is the the same as uh, Section 22, one of the uh, ACL, operates to prescribe a norm normative standard of conduct, which the section itself marks out and makes applicable in connection with the supply of possible supply of financial services. The function of a court exercising jurisdiction to matter arising on the section is to recognise and administer the normative standard of conduct. The court needs to administer that standard in the totality of the circumstances, taking into account of each of the considerations identified in Section 2012 CC, and this is a key bit, if and to the extent that those considerations are applicable in the circumstances. So it doesn't seem to me that paragraph 55 of Quantum actually does support the proposition that Justice Downs has identified in the previous slide. Clearly, Gagel is saying here, the facts are relevant if and to the extent that they're applicable to the circumstances. Now, but she goes on and she says, um, the judge was required to consider the framework of section 22, specifically going through all the factors. And then this other finding, the primary judge was also required to take into account whether and the extent to which any of the relevant considerations section 22 did not arise or had not been the subject of evidence adduced for the ACCC as these matters which could tell against the finding of conscionable conduct. So if a matter hadn't been raised by anyone, um, the ACCC in their complaint, then the fact that they weren't raised led the court to have an obligation to still consider those factors and potentially find that they went against a conclusion of a conscionable conduct. So that's the principle that she believes applies in this particular case. And it's the principle which the majority said clearly didn't apply 
you can't have the court speculating as to matters that aren't the subject of evidence. Clearly, both sides could put on evidence about factors, and I think the failure by the uh, respondents to put on evidence is fairly decisive in that case. So effectively, she concluded that the approach taken by the primary judge in firstly not going through all the 22 factors and then also putting weight on the factors against which there was no evidence, uh, assessing those was an error. So then she went through the factors and she the first one, relative strengths of the bargaining positions, and she says that because the ACCC didn't argue there was a uh, inequality of bargaining peer, uh, positions, that that goes against the finding of contra conduct. So that's a, a finding in favour of the appellates, in, in, in favour of the college. Then the second factor, compliance with cust by the customer with conditions reasonably necessary to protect the legitimate interests of the supplier. Again, there was no absence, uh, uh, there was an absence of evidence on that particular point. Therefore, it goes against the finding of unconscionable conduct. Thirdly, whether the consumer customer was able to understand any documents. Well, there was no finding made by the primary judge that the consumers could not understand the inf information. Therefore, that goes against the finding of a contract conduct. Then, whether any influ undue influence, pressure or unfair tactics was used. And here the judge, the primary judge referred to the risk of undue influence and saying, well, the risk isn't enough. The statutory provision doesn't talk about the risk. It talks where there was actual undue influence. So effectively, the fact that the judge concluded there was a risk as opposed to an actuality meant that that factor didn't go against the college as well. Then she goes through the amount for which and the circumstance under which the consumer could have acquired identical equivalent service from different supplier. Again, there was an absence of evidence. So that went against defining of conscious conduct. Now, who should have put that evidence on? I think probably the respondent should have put that evidence on. And it's almost like they, they should get a benefit from having failed to put on evidence in the primary case. The requirements of any applicable industry code. So there was this uh, applicable industry code for the VAT providers, and that didn't require the college to have a campus-driven withdrawal process or an outbound call process. So the fact that there wasn't a requirement to have these things meant there was a strong argument against a conclusion of a conscionable conduct. And that seemed very strange to me. The extent to which the supplier reasonably failed to make disclosure and the fact that there was disclosure to the consumers with no finding of the information could not be understood by them is a fact, further factor against a finding of unconscionable conduct. So again, there was no finding that they had failed to disclose information, meant that the unconscionable conduct finding could not be upheld. And then finally, the extent to which the supplier and the customer acted in good faith. And then the fact that the college complied and sought to comply with the requirements of the VET guidelines and the HES Act uh, supported a find the college acted in good faith when it made the changes to its systems. So again, that factor goes in favour of the college. So as you can see, she gone through all the factors, include they all actually support the college. They undermine the finding of unconscionable conduct. And then all the other factors that maybe go against the college are irrelevant. They, they've got no bearing on the finding of unconscious conduct. Now, this is a very strange approach, I think, to be taking to unconscious conduct. On the actual and apparent authority point, she actually disagrees again with the majority. She said that clearly what the recruitment agents were doing was obviously contrary to the interests of the college. I'm not too sure about that. Uh, it actually resulted in increased enrolments and a lot of money going to the college's pocket. <clears throat> she also referred to some authority from Bromwich in Ape case, which is another VET case, and he's sort of talking about the the, the level of which uh, conduct would not be considered to be within the actual or apparent authority of an agent, and he described it as being extreme or aberrant behaviour, and she concluded that really the conduct of the recruitment agents in this ca case was aberrant or extreme behaviour and as such could not be considered to be within 
their apparent authority and therefore the principal, the college, could not be held liable for that conduct. Now, I don't know if it was, it was extreme for sure, but was it aberrant? The whole industry was using pretty much the same recruitment agents and everybody's engaging in the same conduct and everybody's aware that the conduct's occurring. Uh, I'm not too sure it's aberrant in the sense of being unusual. It's clearly a, extreme. So just looking at that, it's very concerning that you, you have, you know, three experienced judges to take one particular view, which I must admit, I think Wigney and, and O'Brien are clearly right in the way they've approached all the issues. But the judgment of Downs is, is very unusual and really to go directly against the majority on every issue is, is quite remarkable. I don't quite understand. The decisions are entirely irreconcilable. There's no way you can sort of try to make sense of those. Uh, it is a very big concern that judges have such radically different ideas about unconscionable conduct. And this seems to be the area of the ACL where judges seem to go in all different directions. I recently spoke about the other case on Mazda where the majority went in one direction. Uh, that was uh, Mortimer and Halley. And then Lee went in a totally different direction. And in that case, I think the dissent was actually right. Here, the judges have interpreted the same cases, high court cases, in totally different ways. Some, the, the majority looked at cases saying, well, this actually supports the view that you don't go through section 22 as some sort of checklist. You don't look at factors that, that aren't relevant on their face as being somehow relevant against the finding of a conscionable conduct. And then you've got the dissenting judge, judge saying the opposite thing. So that's concerning. I don't know how that really can ha happen. Uh, given how experienced these judges are. One thing I think is curious here is why the ACCC didn't sue the agents, and I think that's really problematic, that the agents have got away pretty well scot-free. Uh, they they were doing a lot of very dishonest things, and not one agent has been sued by the ACCC about this conduct, and I, and I don't quite understand that. They should have been brought in the mix. I guess there would have been a bit of uh, pointing at each other the agents have been pointing at the at the college and the college will be pointing at the agents, but really they should have been brought into this case. And, and I think that's maybe what Downs is is reacting to. She's saying the people who've, who've done most of the damage here have been the agents and um, why aren't they in the mix? And as I said earlier, you know, this is just another example of the federal court confusion about statutory unconscionability. Like every judge seems to have a very different approach to the way it should apply. And um, I think there's a need for a, a further high court consideration of statutory unconscionability like Cobelt. If anybody's read Cobelt, they know how confusing that case is and, and really the principles in there can be used to um, justify so many different positions. So really there needs to be a good vehicle taken to the high court and get some definitive judgment. Clearly this wouldn't be a great vehicle, I don't think. But uh, ACCC needs to be looking out for something or, or ASIC to take to the High Court. And I also think maybe Gagler sort of restrained some of the comments he makes about conscious conduct because he made a few comments which have created a little bit of confusion, like the model obloquy comments, which he subsequently resolved from. And this idea that the word may is uh, conditional, not permissive. I'm not too sure I understand that. Uh, observation. So maybe uh, a little bit more Australian in making comments uh, because uh, people do pick up pick up on them and seek to use them to justify positions. So um, I guess stick to the stick to the legislation. Anyway, that's all I had. Hopefully that's been helpful. If you've got any questions, feel free to give me a call or drop me an email. Bye bye.